Welcome to a brand new episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener. On Outliers, every week I sit down with an incredible entrepreneur or investor to decode what they've mastered and identify the ideas, models, and cheat codes we can all put to work in our own lives. Today, I'm excited to share my conversation with Rob Petrozo. He's the co-founder and chief product officer at Rally, which has spent the last five years building an incredible marketplace for real-world collectibles, which includes everything from baseball cars to famous cars and James Bond movies to insane items like meteorites and triceratops skulls. All of these are real things that have actually sold on Rally. And on Rally, anyone can buy these items fully or they can buy into them fractionally. And then every 60 days afterwards, those items open back up for resale on their secondary market. So naturally, as part of this conversation, Rob and I take a step back and cover the rising world of digital collectibles, from moments on NBA top shots to NFTs and everything in between. This rising digital economy is already worth billions and it's just getting started. Beyond that, Rob and I discuss why ownership is the new status symbol, We map out the world of digital collectibles. We talk about the mechanics of Rally's business from how they source items to how they store them. And we talk about Rally's journey to build an enduring world-class marketplace from day one, which has been a long journey and it's something that they started on five years ago. This episode is one of my all-time favorite conversations. As always, for the full show notes, links, and the transcript of this conversation, visit outliers.fm. And please, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with just one friend or leave us a short review on Apple Podcasts. Both of these things help us land more incredible guests and they help more people discover outliers. And now let's get to the show and jump into my conversation with Rob Petrozo of Rally. So today we've got Rob Petrozo from Rally on the show. Rob, welcome to the show. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. No, likewise, man. I really appreciate it. So I wanted to do this conversation for a few reasons. And one of those is to help everyone listening have a better, more nuanced understanding of digital collectibles, as well as kind of how Rally fits into that mix. But I want to start first with your background, because you've got a super fascinating background that has a lot of parallels to what we're going to be talking about. So for everyone listening, can you just share a quick sketch of what you did leading up to founding Rally? Yeah, so I'll give you a quick pitch. So I'm a, much like you, I think I'm a designer at heart. And I think that art and design have always played a really important part of my life from when I was really young. So I grew up in Brooklyn. My parents both were, uh, my dad had a restaurant. My mom was a chef as well. But both of them were really creative. My mom in particular was kind of like an illustrator and an artist growing up. And she kind of instilled a lot of that creativity in me. And a lot of it was kind of like finding my own way through design when I was younger. So when you're growing up, especially where I'm, the neighborhood that I'm from, where it was a really diverse group of people. And I live with my grandparents and my parents were around. There was always family around. Everybody was always doing something different. There were a lot of older kids in the neighborhood who were like the cool skateboarders or, or kids that were starting businesses that were a little bit older than me. I got exposed to all this stuff and I kind of used creativity and design was really my method of sort of incorporating myself into those conversations. So when you're growing up, it's like you see somebody doing something cool and you kind of want to emulate that. So there would be kids that were like cool skateboarders in the neighborhood And then I would want to be like designing skateboards or doing illustrations that would go on their skateboards. And I get like a marker and do that in the backyard, stuff like that. And that led to a lot of really creative exploration as I got into high school and trying to sort of major in art as I got to college. That was always like the goal was to be kind of a fine art major and get out of school and be like a working artist was the idea when I was younger. So I went to school in Philadelphia. Half our company at this point is from Philadelphia. I feel like everybody has Philadelphia or Brooklyn roots at this point, no matter who you meet in life. But I've never really lived anywhere other than New York, except for when I was there in Philly. And again, similar situation, you meet a bunch of people, and this is in like, you know, the early 2000s, where product design was just starting to show itself as a real kind of career path. And it was something that it was web 2.0. It wasn't necessarily like iPhone yet or anything that was really mobile. But you can see the hints of that self-taught creativity of people learning how to code and working on like, you know, cracked versions of Photoshop and trying to teach themselves. And I was part of that wave too, the same way. So I got out of school. I had this toolkit that was a little bit of code, a bunch of design, a little bit of fine art education. And I wound up in music. So when I got out of school, I was working on my first actual job that was like a paycheck from somebody else was for uh, Kanye West label, which was called Good Music, which was under a, a Sony umbrella. But it was basically a startup. So one of his managers called me. He had seen a design that I worked on that was sitting in a print shop in Queens, actually. And he asked the people who made it, who designed it. And they gave him my number. And he called me and said, you know, I have this artist, Kanye West. His album comes out in a couple of weeks. Would you want to come in? And we're looking to sort of bring designers on board because we have a roster of artists. And at that point, it was like John Legend in the early days. And there was a couple other groups they were working with in common was kind of a part of the group, too, that they were bringing in-house. 
but they got a small budget from Sony, a small office tucked all the way in the back of the 17th floor at the Sony building. And they just had ideas and it was like, let's just all work together to bring ideas to life. And that was clothing and websites and packaging and tour merchandise and all these things that opened this toolkit for me that allowed me to sort of, you know, work in kind of a startup environment with a small team of really unique creatives. And that just led to a bunch of opportunities. So I was there for a couple of years, working on a million different projects, doing side stuff at the same time, sort of some of my graphic design stuff and working with a bunch of different people in the music industry and creative direction and clothing. 2007, 2008, the iPhone comes out, it changes everything. And now everybody is like a product designer or an interaction designer. And I found myself doing the same thing. You had no choice at that point. So there were four or five startups in New York that I was talking to. I wound up working with a couple of them, creative direction, product design, a bunch of startups here in New York. And then eventually you realize you want to do something on your own. I have to have some really smart people around me. My two co-founders, Max and Chris in particular, who I've known for a long time. And it led to what is Rally today, which I know that was a long, windy story. But in reality, it's just art led to design, led to interaction design, led to product design. That's kind of where I am today. That's a beautiful way to put a point on it. I have to ask, what was the piece that they saw in this shop? Was it you know, album artwork? Was it a poster? Yeah, it was a design for a DJ named DJ Drama from Atlanta, who's a close friend and somebody who in Atlanta is really well known. He's really well known everywhere now. He discovered Little Uzi Vert and Jack Harlow is his artist now. So somebody that had a lot of longevity in the music industry, but also somebody that was originally from Philly. So I was working when I was in school, trying to do like mixtape artwork and a bunch of little things here and there. DJ Drama was one of the first people that I worked with and kind of gave me a chance. And for some reason, he was getting his stuff printed in New York. I have no idea why, but that was a very uh, serendipitous conversation that we had early on. And then it led to a lot of really good stuff for me as well. One parallel that I want to ask about is, well, we're going to get to this when we talk more about Rally, but so much of it is kind of owning a moment. And it is does feel like this cultural movement that's happening at the moment. And it's interesting to me that you start off your career doing a lot of effectively kind of cultural design work at Good Music. You know what, I guess, can you talk a little bit about the experience of working there and working with some of the artists? And can you talk about what it's like designing for stuff that's going to become a part of culture or is a part of culture? Yeah, I mean, it's weird because everything there was so it was like a freelance group of people who were all working under sort of one roof. And Kanye has four or five people around him at the time, especially that were, you know, from Chicago that were super, super creative, that were just people that looked at everything we were doing as a business. So everything was very much kind of like self-taught and just move as quick as possible. So I think one of the big things that 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 instilled is that you're only going to go like that. I was only in that office like two, three days a week. I go in there, drop off stuff, have conversations. I wound up getting a small office of my own in Dumbo in downtown Brooklyn, just so I could have like other clients and people come in and see that it was real, that I was doing design work that was real and it was a real business. But you go in there and it was a little bit, I didn't want to say unorganized. That's the wrong way to put it. But everybody knew that that was kind of a stopping point. I think all the ancillary people that were working on stuff and it was, you're only going to go as far as the work you put in. So there'd be situations like one of John Legend's first tours was called Spend the Night with John Legend. And that was a piece that they had the title, but there was a lot of stuff that went with it. So it was like, let's make some ideas around. There was a splash page and a website. There were some press passes. One of the things though that I still use today at Rally was they wanted to do something unique for the merch. And there was like merch tables back then. So you'd go to a concert and it'd be like a small venue. I think one of these was at PNC Bank Arts Center in uh, Jersey, which is like a big lawn. And you walk in and there's like a couple thousand people, but you have to stop at this booth in the front. So it was like spend the night with John Legend. And the idea was like, why don't we make like a scented candle that we sell as merch? Everyone was just selling t-shirts at the time, you know? And that was kind of like a thing where it sounds so obvious now, but back then merch meant like a tour t-shirt and like a thermos and like a hat, you know, it wasn't something where people were thinking about tangible product, but I was looking at it the same way. I think that companies like Supreme look at things now where you're not just making one, it's not an item. It's not a, a piece of clothing. It's not a one wear thing. It's something that really could be a collectible. And that's how I kind of looked at all this stuff. So situations like that, it wasn't just like make something and throw an idea out. It was like, give me the whole start to finish. So whether it was something like we were doing t-shirts for bike week in Florida and they were all going to Miami. And the idea was like, yo, we want to flip the logo and do something cool. Maybe make it look like Harley Davidson or whatever. So I was like, all right. So I did that quick, but then it was like also do the rest of it. So I'm calling my cousin who has like a print shop to try and make the t-shirts and I'm running to FedEx afterwards and packaging stuff up and I'm putting like the thank you notes in it too. And then I'm getting that to the shore club in Miami. So it was almost like, here's an idea, run with it, put it to work and make sure it comes out right. And that's really what startups are now. Like now we're at a 30 person company at Rally. It's not that different. If you have an idea, that's great. But execution of that idea and making sure it's something that lasts is always something that I think that moment in time kind of instilled that in me. And I try and instill that in everybody here at the company now, especially on the product and design side. 
And to your credit, I mean, that is a rare skill, I think, for creatives in general. <laughs> you know, creatives can be incredible at the process of actually doing their work, but honestly, pretty terrible at pulling everything together and actually making something happen. So it's no surprise to me that you kind of learned those skills early on. And I think that that clearly helped you have a little bit of an edge as a designer starting a company. I would hope so. I mean, it's one of those things where it's, you have no choice now, like being a Swiss Army knife and being able to learn on the fly. It's such an underrated skill when everybody's so much of a specialist now, like to be a generalist isn't always a bad thing when you can deliver. I totally agree. So I want to move and talk about, to kind of set the stage for Rally, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about digital collectibles. And that may be an overly vague, overly broad kind of label for it. But in my mind, you know, if we think back to 2020, think to what we've already seen happen in 2021, there's been the takeoff of NFTs, which has just been insane, especially seeing those immediately go within what felt like 30 to 60 days to major, major, major auctions at Sotheby's and Christie's has been insane to see the revenue generated by Top Shot uh, selling kind of moments from the NBA is incredible. We've also got crypto and tokens that feel like they've really taken off. And I know that it doesn't really fit tightly within the label of digital collectibles, but clearly that's an aspect of, I think, what's led to this. And then we've got Rally. So can you talk a little bit about, I guess, how you, you know, do those things fit together in your mind and how do they fit together? And then where does Rally fit in and how is it distinct and different? Yeah. So, I mean, they all work in tandem with me and they always have. The idea of a collectible is whatever you want it to be. And I think when you think about art, like art is everything you need it to be too, the same way. It can recharge you. It sparks new ideas. It evokes emotion. It reminds you, you know, what you should be doing next or reminds you of a time in the past. All those things that are part of NFTs and what bring NFTs to life and what sparked so much of this conversation are really at the root of what Rally is too. So at its heart, you know, I'm 10 minutes in right now. I haven't explained what Rally is, but it's a platform for buying and selling equity in these high value assets with this real historical or cultural significance or ones that will be really significant for the future and owning true equity in that. I think what NFTs provide is an opportunity for that from a creator standpoint that never really existed. So I think that the big thing right now, and whether it's NFTs or crypto or sports cards or any of these vintage luxury, all these things that are at the forefront right now, and especially over the last year and the last 12 months specifically, Everybody wants to be first, right? Everybody wants to be perceived as a futurist or everybody wants to be able to say, I told you so when something works out later. And these young technologists now, they have a little bit more money to play with than ever before. So you basically have all three of those things working in tandem. And that's what NFTs present this opportunity to jump ahead and really see around that turn. But from a creative standpoint too, and this is something that I think music, for everything that the music industry has done wrong, they did a few things really well. One thing they did is that the artists realized that taking back ownership of their product and their equity was cool and that's something you should be doing and that wasn't always the case the idea of signing to a major label was like a huge thing when i was younger and that's part of what drove me to work in music the status symbol 100 percent, no question but now that status symbol is like ownership it's not showing that you have it it's actually having it i think from a creative standpoint to be able to create your art and your work and be able to monetize that and let the crowd and the community you've built actually decide what that value is is super interesting and that's what nfts present but from the supply side and like this bid side too, you have somebody who could really own something that they truly care about and they could do it in a way where they're paying their creator directly in most cases. I think that's so much of what we tried to build at Rally is the idea that you're bringing together people, the things they care about and the moment that's most important to them and then kind of put their money where their mouth is. I think that's happening on both sides of the platforms right now. Sure. And I think it would be helpful. You know, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Rally with a more nuance at the end of this conversation. But just to build on top of what you said, you know, with NFTs, in my experience so far, you know, some of those are artists, like a good example is, you know, I've seen a handful of photographers that clearly sell physical prints or someone has licensed their work previously, but then they are doing it as an addition of one as an NFT and selling it to somebody. And so in that respect, you know, maybe there's some sort of physical thing, but you never get the physical thing. And it's not really backed by the physical thing. You just own this on the blockchain, you know, with something like Top Shot, it's footage from a game, or a moment from a game or a photo of a game. So sure, this thing happened in real life, but you're owning, again, this kind of digital embodiment of this thing. But with Rally, what's really different is it is, if my understanding, it's 100% physical things. And, and so can you talk a little bit about just some of the insane physical stuff that you've sold and how that is fundamentally different? that someone at the end of the day owns that, owns a slice of that. Yeah, I mean, it's again, equity is something that's it's cool now. And it's something you should sort of think about. In my mind, what we've seen on Rally, at least, is that 
you have people who have an investment account and they have a Robinhood account or they have a Coinbase account. This is a complement to that in a way that this is where they keep all their alternative assets. And that could be a physical, it could be digital, it could be anything that has this very sort of specific appeal to a specific group and the people that really care about it. We've always looked at what we do as passion-led investing. So each asset is its own investment. It's got its own total value, its own share price, and its own investors. When we open an initial offering on our platform, we do them every single day, basically. You have a lot of people who really love those individual items. They don't necessarily invest in every single thing on Rally because we have, to your point, this big breadth of individual assets, 12, 13, 14 individual asset classes right now and growing basically every couple of weeks. But it's everything from a Triceratops skull that's a 65 million year old asset to you know some of the modern rookie cards, people that that just got into the league over the last two years, the Lucas of the world and the Giannis, the people that are just starting to sort of get to the peak of their career but haven't gotten there yet. So the ability to sort of invest in history, whether it's past, present, or potential future history, if it's relevant and people care about it, they'll find their way to rally and be able to make that investment. And that to me has always been the most important part is that access, that democratization. The idea that I might be able to see around this turn because I know all the nuance associated with this specific person or this moment or this asset. I want to put that in my portfolio. And there really haven't been many options to do that up to this point for the last hundred years of what the modern stock exchange has created. But over the last you know five or six years as we built this platform, we're starting to see that that door got kicked down and a lot of people are realizing what that value actually looks like. Yeah. And I think you made a really interesting point there. You know, and I've heard this a lot on the investing side of people saying like they're investing in Coinbase or they're investing in Robinhood because they know that the future is everyone's going to have a handful of apps on their phone that they use to interact with investments and they want to own a stake in one of those. And I think it's really interesting to think forward in that example you gave of maybe someone has Robinhood for their equity, their options, all of that stuff that they want to do. They've got Coinbase for everything crypto related, then rallies this other thing for everything that's alternative. I think that's super interesting. And then the other thing I want that, you know, is just kind of, I don't know, it would be a super funny future reality. You know, today you'll see Twitter bios and it'll be like investor in, you know, this company and this company. And I would love to see a bio that's like investor in Triceratops school. <laughs> We're starting to see it now. If you go on Twitter and, and look at like our mentions, you'll see a lot of people started doing that. I think that that's the biggest, that's the most important thing about what's happening right now. For what it's worth over the last year, I think everybody likes to immediately say the only reason that all these assets have started to do really well. And there's all these yeah. new companies popping up is that people went into their mom's attic and found their old baseball cards, but it's bigger than that. It's this last year more than anything to me, it taught a lot of people that time is truly currency. And it's something that got lost, I think, when you're like us and it's like a designer trying to turn into a product designer, trying to chase you know, a career, all these elements that go with it. People younger than me, and I hate to date myself and say like young people, but it's true. <laughs> people that are 12, 25 and under, they've always treated time as currency. Like They grew up like that to a certain degree. I think those kids are spending the majority of their time today on like the assets of tomorrow, the things they really care about. So I firmly do believe that. And to them, NFTs might be to them what Michael Jordan was to me, or, you know, Fortnite is their version of Pokemon. So trying to see around those turns and seeing what that next generation's doing, they don't look at equity and ownership the same way that I did, or the same way that my generation did, where it was go to work, get a job, maybe have a, an index fund or some sort of Vanguard fund or put your money in some passive investment app and let it sit. They're looking at things like I can jump around and do the things that I truly know about and I care about because I know more than the people that came before me about what the future looks like. And we're trying to support that as best we can at Rally. Yeah. Maybe just to add on top of that, the thread for me that makes explains all of these things and ties it together pretty neatly is because I've heard other people bring up stuff like, why is it and how is it that Airbnb or Coinbase, you know, which looks like it's going to IPO at an extremely high valuation kind of historically, but you've seen this wave of companies, you know, DoorDash is another example of that. And people scratch their heads. And I think similarly, people look at crypto and NFTs and rally and potentially scratch their head. But in my mind, the way it all makes sense is what we're seeing is 18 to say 32, 35 year olds basically say and put their stamp with their money on what they want to invest in. And now I think they don't want to have physical collectibles. That's not cool. You can't share that with anyone. I can't show anyone in my portfolio. I want to have digital collectibles. You know, they believe in crypto and that that is a physical, tangible thing that makes sense to them and has value. And I think similarly, they see companies like Airbnb and they're like, I don't care what the valuation is. I want a stake in that. That's a business that I care about. So it's this younger generation really putting their stamp on culture. Is that how you see it? Do you think that's bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts on nah, that? Nah, I mean, you hit it on the head. First and foremost, to me, like, just from a tangible aspect, there's always a place for the best in class assets. I think that, you know, I 
I'm in my apartment right now. And my girlfriend wants to throw me out because I'm in like a separate bedroom, which I turn into an office, and it's surrounded by things from my past that make me happy. And it's like yeah, no, no one can see it, but there is stuff <laughs> on shelves all around you. I mean, it looks it's very neat and tidy, but there's you know a lot of stuff. <laughs> I mean, neat and tidy is a good way to put it, but in reality, there's boxes and storage and like at my parents' house and tucked in closets right now. But the stuff that's important to me is the stuff that I connect with from my childhood. For other people, it's not like that, and we want to give them the opportunity to invest in the things that they truly care about. So. When we talk about a triceratops skull or like some of the dinosaur stuff or meteorites or any of these things that are coming up on rally, the stuff that you learned about in fourth and fifth grade and like the great Gatsby required reading when I was in middle school or, or getting into high school to have the first edition version on rally was an important thing for me. And I think for a lot of people on our platform, because even if it's the tangible thing is not something you're holding in your hands, connecting with something that you know is real, that you truly believe in, and that creates this positive emotion and this positive nostalgia or recollection, or it's something where you can again see around the corners and feel like this is something that will stick around forever. Providing that opportunity, whether it's a digital collectible or a physical collectible, tangible or intangible, is something that it's really important to all of our users. and. The average age of our user right now is around, you know, 27, 28 years old for any investor on Rally. Those are people that, again, like they see around turns in a way that I think me in my, in my mid to late 30s does not see anymore. So to be able to provide them with the opportunity and then see how they gravitate towards that has been really interesting and encouraging. To see somebody invest in a baseball car from 1906 or 1907 and, you know, it's around literally 100 years before them is pretty crazy to see the velocity at which that group has really gravitated towards these things from the past. One thing I wanted to ask, and this is kind of a question both for you, and I'll frame this up in a second, as well as you know for the customers that you see on the platform. And I think it's super interesting to know that that average age is 27, 28. But just knowing a little bit about your background, you've invested in equities, you know, you've invested in crypto, you've invested in stuff on Rally. And one thing that that gets me thinking about is kind of like, what does the asset allocation model look like for this next generation? Because you know, typically, if we were rewind back, there's kind of the 60, 40, you've got 40% in bonds, 60% in stocks. And now it seems like we're going through a pretty massive change where, you know, I'm just going to pull something out of thin air, but you could imagine someone, say, have 60, 70 percent of their portfolio in equities, say 20 percent in crypto, 10 percent in collectibles. I don't know your thoughts on have you given that much thought and do you see your users? I mean, are they investing in this as opposed to stocks and, and crypto? Or are they doing it alongside it? Just any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's the right question. It's something that it's up to everybody's sort of individual investing thesis. So again, none of this is ever investment advice. And I can only speak for myself and what we've seen on the platform. I think that we're seeing a much more savvy investor than I was when I was 18 or 19 years old. So when I got out of school and you start paying attention to the easiest thing, the path of least resistance was equities. And it was like a TD Ameritrade account or a, I think I might've had an E-Trade account. I forget what it was back then. But your optionality is really only around going long equities. And it was something that you're only privy to the information that's on CNBC or that you're sort of getting surfaced to you on a day to day because the internet was still young compared to now. The apps didn't exist. The information asymmetry was way different. Now, Twitter is way ahead or on the same sort of timeline when it comes to information as the CNBCs of the world or as the Wall Street Journals. And I think that there's always a place for both of those to exist. But these kids today have so much more access to information so and so many more on ramps, rally included. So when we see an investor come to our platform, Again, we look at it as kind of passion-led investing, where one individual asset or something that you really care about is what drives you to rally and brings you here. But once you get here, we see that our investors diversify really quickly. So you have somebody who might have come in for like a Michael Jordan rookie card, but then they start to see that shared DNA and some other stuff from that same time frame, or things that Michael Jordan liked, which are also on the platform, or the things that are sort of about the 80s and 90s where you grew up and you remember it. And they start to really invest their time and effort into understanding everything about that asset. It's not just the stories that we tell, but they're bringing up stuff on our Twitter page and our Instagram comments that they did their own research and they found this, this, and this, and they're asking questions about it. So I think that what's changed dramatically over the last, call it decade, is that a young investor who really cares has the on-ramps and the ability to sort of invest in assets like these on Rally. They're able to do it at a, a really approachable price point. So like on Rally, there's no minimums, there's, you know, shares that started a dollar at a time. So you could buy one share at one dollar and kind of see how the whole process works and use that as your on ramp. And they also have this I'm not talking about like YOLO trades and GameStop type stuff, but they had this courage that I think I didn't have too when I was younger. They had the idea that I'm making a great investment for me and here's why. And they go through that checklist in their brain. They know how to buy dips. They understand what demand looks like. They can look through order books and have takeaways in a way that I never did. They're putting together their own Excel sheets about how the whole process works and where to allocate their money. So We've seen that, and I've kind of seen that firsthand, 
especially over the last year, call it, where everyone's had a little bit more time on their hands. And I think the cash economy is starting to die off a little bit where even just holding a dollar bill in your hand feels kind of dirty right now in a way where it's like that's kind of starting to move in a different way. They found a way to sort of diversify, start digital and have all these individual portfolios that are based on their passions and their needs. And I think that rally is a compliment to all of those. Yeah, it's super interesting. Maybe again, you know, something that was like popping up in my mind as you were saying that is it almost feels like this latest generation of investors is just like they don't care what the conventional wisdom is or what they should, quote unquote, invest in. They are truly just like, what do I want to invest in? What do I want to put my money into? Which is really exciting. And I think that's also why it feels like the wild, wild west, because you no longer have this, you know, I don't want to use a negative analogy, but you no longer have this kind of herd of sheep. You've just got a bunch of people that are headed off in their own direction doing their own things, which is, you know, neat and exciting. It's (laughs) super excited because i mean when i was younger there was this i've i've been lucky in that like again i credit my parents for this more than anything else but you know they were young they kind of let me do whatever i wanted and they always encouraged me to pursue things that might have been a little bit left field so when all my friends started getting into i was playing baseball and i would play a bunch of sports but when like being in plays wasn't cool like that was something i really wanted to do though so like becoming trying to be an actor was like my mom was like yeah if you want to do that go do it when i was 11 or 12 years old and that became like a thing that i was into and then art the same way when everybody was taking as few classes as possible senior year of high school and even in college and i was in these four or five hour art labs to me that was something i really loved doing and it was something i wasn't i was going to dedicate my time to so now you have these kids who they've been in those kind of niche groups i think a lot of them when it comes to sort of especially the investments they're finding themselves in they translated that to like, you know, really big discord groups and really big sort of telegram channels where they're having conversations with a bunch of people. It's so much easier to find your own subreddit and to find the place where you fit and where so many people want to have that conversation with you. So you might have thought it was you and two or three friends. Everything now, the information is so much about global reach and finding your tribe and realizing how much bigger it is than just you and the three or four people that you thought were into this. And that's what I think Rally's always done a really good job of is finding those groups and presenting the best possible asset or this really unique item that really evokes a response and an emotion from that group that we know is way bigger and way more impactful than just you and the four friends who you thought it was. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I love that parallel of thinking about reddits and subreddits is almost like asset classes and sub asset classes. And you're just now seeing, I don't know, it's like the pyramid getting flipped upside down. And we're just now seeing all these little so kind of true. niche groups and niche ways of investing just blow up. So true. So true. And you said it too. It's like their risk profile is so much different than mine was because they have all these opportunities, you know, and it's, if you look through history, it's always been this. It's always been like the early adopters who are the ones that are able to stake their claim. And they do it in a way where you have to move a little bit quicker now than you did 20 or 30 years ago because, again, the on-ramps exist. But it's just like in the 30s and 40s, stocks were considered too risky for pension plans. you know. And then in the 60s, it was, it was all bonds. And then they started to integrate stocks. But REITs were a little bit too risky. And then by 2001, REITs were added to the S&P. And now they're a big part of that index. So it's the same sort of idea that alternatives, which are a little bit of everything, whether it's baseball cards or crypto or dinosaur fossils or anything or classic cars and all these different asset classes, the ability to access the information, find the group that really understands it and be able to communicate with it. And then the on-ramp to make that investment exists in a way that the risk profile has changed dramatically for the people who get it. And again, you made a super interesting point there of there is a history kind of a historical record of these things that were fringe alternatives becoming mainstream over time. And we're just now seeing a handful of those that right now I think are for some people, they think they're mainstream or they know they're mainstream. I think for others, they think they're fringe and scary and bubbly and all these other things. And But we're seeing a wave of those, which is interesting. Yeah, you should be scared. For what it's worth, like you should be a little bit scared. You shouldn't go into anything and just dive all the way in. You should read every disclaimer, whether it's rally or anywhere else. And you should really become a sophisticated investor. But to your point, it's the amount of information that's available now, just going on YouTube and looking up, you know, we have a broad side of the Declaration of Independence coming up on rally in May. And that's something that it's got the craziest amount of history behind it. But it's also something that there's, you know, only a handful that have ever come to market in any meaningful way where it was transacted in the open. But if you go to YouTube or you Google it, there's so much information about why it's meaningful, what it is, way more than we can pack into the app. And we're already starting to see that, you know, people that had conversations and want to know more about it, as soon as we put it in preview in the app, they're doing so much research and they're telling us stuff about it that we haven't even released to the public yet. So it's always interesting to see how that dynamic changes when you trigger somebody's real imagination. And it's this young sort of savvy investor who wants to learn more. They're going to be able to learn more really quickly. And it just kicks them off on this super interesting trajectory of like learning about stuff that I'm sure otherwise they would have no interest, <laughs> no curiosity Absolutely, in, in learning yeah. about. 
So I want to now transition to talking more in depth about Rally. And one thing that I wanted to start at, you know, which we talked about kind of in the lead up to this interview is something to me that is fascinating is people that are early in a space and what they see that brings them into that space. And the fact that they're there as this story really plays out in real time, I think there's just really interesting insights. And Rally makes a ton of sense in the world that we're at now. But it was founded in 2016, which is, you know, feels like an eternity ago. And there was kind of, at least from my experience, my recollection, there was none of these kind of positive tailwinds that we've really seen over the last five years, but really over the last 12 to 18 months. So one question I wanted to start with is, what was the unique insight or unique perspective you had that made you so convicted that this was going to be a thing and that it made sense to start Rally? Yeah, I'll go all the way back and I'll keep it brief. So because it was a lot of highs and lows and there were times where I was like, there's no possible way this is going to work when we were talking about it in 2014, 2015. But at that point, when we started talking about this in a real way, myself, Chris, who I went to high school with and I've known forever, Max, who was his college roommate, who's our CFO and our other co-founder, we've always sort of talked for like a year. We were having a conversation about working together on something. At that point, Max was at Barclays doing private placement deals, similar to what we do now, but at a much bigger scale. Chris was an operator, one of the smartest kids I'd ever met. He had come from venture and he'd worked at a bunch of different high growth companies, had run a couple of those companies as well, had an exit, somebody who really understood this space in terms of how to build a business. And then I was coming at it from a product perspective. I was at a company called Kimi here in New York, building out their whole product. And then I was at a hedge fund in between building out consumer software for these hedge fund managers at a company called Aries. Oh yeah, Aries is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, so at that point, they had just gone from being a $15 billion fund to having like $100 billion under management. So you have all the big takeaway for me from a product side there was that you had these super wealthy fund managers who have 20 people working for them, but they have all these legacy systems to work in. And they really wanted everything they work in to look and feel and act like the consumer apps that they knew best, not some enterprise app with just spreadsheets. So we'd all had our individual takeaways from the worlds in which we worked. But when we sat down, we started thinking about finance first because we'd all sort of had some degree of exposure to it. It was a zero sum game. It was just make money by any means. And that's like, there's nuance to it though. And we always realized that if people wanted to sort of invest in the things they care about, it was super hard. And to them, because it was so hard, they walked away from it, they didn't even try. So this is now 2015, right? And it's Robinhood is really starting to become a thing. Crypto was on its first wave where things are starting to go crazy in the beginning of super early, but 2015 was also when you start seeing headlines because you're making all time highs, but you're getting a lot of volatility around it too, which tends to happen in the beginning of any of these markets. Messaging was also starting to take over. So what was once in person and like phone conversations is now flying all over the place in a million different inputs every day, whether it was Twitter or texting, which had really like iMessage becoming a more real thing over the course of that two year period. So this created that perfect storm. And I say this a lot, but I think 2015 was really one of the most important moments for and the most important years for technology adoption of our generation because the walls of access started to fall in every imaginable way. Finance was kind of less. So what we started to see were the things we cared about and that we were sending each other in text messages and group chats was these crazy auction results where you'd start to see like anti-car auctions in particular and some of the big headline news was all over TV. There was this start of a willingness there to invest in new assets on new platforms like the Robin Hoods and the Coinbases. And you had these huge auction results for all these individual assets that were going to auction. There was no way for the group that cared most about those things to make an investment in them. So that was the big aha moment where we had a lot of ideas on cocktail napkins, literally basically at like coffee houses having the conversation. But we realized like Max's experience dealing with this on the finance side, Chris's experience as an operator and mine from a product perspective, if we put our heads together, and found the right method to bring this live and the right assets to start with, we can incorporate all those things into one bucket and turn an idea into something very, very meaningful very quickly. And then the big sort of defining characteristic that allowed us to do that was that the Jobs Act had created this world where non-accredited investors could invest in the asset classes and, and the investment types that were deemed a little bit too risky for those people earlier. So you have the SEC who's really making an attempt to close that wealth gap and platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and some of the crowdfunding platforms were leveraging this new rule to allow for non-accredited investors to make investments. So we felt like we could probably do the same thing. We talked to our lawyers about it, and it turned out that there was a possibility we could do that. So that it was heads down building for 18 months, basically. 
it's amazing that you cite the Jobs Act there because I feel like most of the time people talk about anytime a startup founder talks about regulation, it's not like here's this thing that enabled us to innovate <laughs> and to disrupt and bring something to market. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's weird because you know everyone looks at financial regulation sometimes. I think, and this is where crypto, in my mind, got it wrong early on. There's a bunch of problems and a bunch of solutions. When you have a solution in place like we did early on, which was going through this regulated route and getting all these assets qualified by the SEC as true investments, we were doing that in the peak of the ICO boom of that 2016, 2016 sort of rug pull in crypto where everybody was raising huge sums of non-dilutive capital. And they're doing that at rates that no one had ever seen before. In weeks, they were able to raise 30, 40, 50 million dollars. And you have a bunch of people that we would talk to early on the same way people ask us about NFTs now, they were saying, why don't you just do an ICO? Why don't you tokenize these things? Why don't you make a utility token as opposed to a security token? We had a really unique structure in place with the way that we submit all of our assets to the SEC that that to us was really just the problem that we didn't have to solve for. We'd already solved for it and we wanted to build trust. And we knew that if you go any route that wasn't going that regulated route, you're putting yourself in a position where you can't come back later on. For us as a new company, you have two things that you want to do. One, it's proved that the assets are unique and investment worthy, but at the same time, you want to prove that Rally is the most trusted place to get those. And for us to make those two things work, it required us leveraging what already existed, but also working with the powers that be to make sure we were doing it above board. And that actually was innovation for us more than anything else. I think that's super, super interesting. So you talked about there, I mean, 2015, 2016, maybe that bleeds a, a little bit into 2017. I would love to talk about what you've seen over the last, say, 12 to 18 months, because in my mind, 2020 and the first three months were three months and a few days into 2021 have just been really transformative on a number of those spaces that we talked about. How has that impacted your business? How has that impacted interest in rally thoughts? Yeah, I mean... We're seeing a lot of the same challenges, the same wins, and the same sort of challenges that we have to overcome that we did even in 2017. Part of that is always around that imagination, getting people to understand what you're doing when you do it in a way that we do, where we don't have, we're not aggressively marketing any of these. We don't do something where we're calling people and telling them to invest in stuff. We just want to tell stories as best we can inside this app and let all of our investors make that decision for themselves, whether or not it's investment worthy and whether or not they truly care about it, whether they want to put some money into it or whether they just want to watch from the sidelines, which we're always okay with too, because we're trying to really build this entire marketplace more than anything else. So for us, the biggest thing that we've seen is that willingness and that openness to try something new has changed dramatically over the last 18 months. So again, when people look at, people always ask that question to us and they say, they'll ask it away where they say, you know, how has the pandemic affected your business? And the answer that we give sometimes, I think, which is the more tangible answer is that our metrics all look better now than they did 18 months ago, but we were building towards that moment for the last six years. You know what I mean? So it's not something that we didn't prepare for. Obviously, nobody prepared for a pandemic, but our goal was always sort of diversify, bring the best assets to market. And for what it's worth, like our secondary market, which all runs through registered broker dealers, we're the only platform out that had an active secondary market before the pandemic. And they, we were doing it in a way where it was always about bringing the best assets, the most quality museum quality assets to our investors and doing that in a way that let them make the decision. So I think the big difference from 18 months ago to now, the metrics and the growth aside, is that everybody's willingness to try something new. And again, like that time is currency idea has really accelerated in a way that I think nobody could have ever predicted. So the ability to sort of find what you want and that access lane is something that we created well before the pandemic. What happened is that that access lane, it got flooded with people who really saw what we were doing as value and found the assets that they're really passionate about on our platform. And were able to do much more of that research on their own before they got to us. So when they got to Rally, they were able to make a very informed decision quickly. Yeah. So one thing I think would be interesting to explore just to help kind of flesh this out for everybody listening that kind of gets it, you know, at this point we've talked about, so these are physical assets. They have a lot of history or they're unique or they're extremely limited in kind of nature. You then take those, turn them into equity where you've got a number of shares of these and people can then buy that on the platform and build a portfolio. But what I think would be really interesting is, you know, I love that line you just shared. So these are museum quality assets, which is in my mind, super different and super interesting. Walk us through the process of you guys finding or identifying or buying a museum quality asset all the way through the sale actually happening and people being able to purchase these. What does that look like? What does that journey look like? Yeah, so I'll start with 2017, sort of when we first targeted the assets that we were looking for. So the name of the company was Rally Road originally. I think everybody looked at that and thought, oh, it's about cars because we launched with classic cars. But 
that was kind of the secondary piece. We really looked at it as like another Wall Street. That was the idea. It's like a different Wall Street where you and your friends who really care about something are passionate. You show up somewhere and make that investment together. So for us, finding the things that people would really be interested in was always the most important part. So we started with classic cars. It was something that it was all over reality television. It was something that if you talk to the Discovery Channels of the world and some of the people that we talked to early on, it's the fastest growing segment of reality television. It was something that everybody cared about. The auction results were printed everywhere. There were all these new records happening. But also it's like this big piece of metal, this 3,000 pound thing you have to store somewhere and the insurance is expensive and you have to roll the tires but you can't drive it. So that was a big challenge for us and finding the best quality assets is going to be a challenge. So early on, you know, we work with some of the smartest people in the space and whenever possible we bring them in-house but we always have great advisors around us and people who've been working with the auction houses and we've created this great global network that allows us to source the best possible assets whether that's a purchase a consignment working with an auction house we have our checklist that speaks to all the must-haves if it's a car it's about the mileage and the provenance and the history and what the rarity is the serial numbers making sure everything matches but there's also these intangible aspects that go with that. And that's things like making sure that an asset is relevant right now, but will be relevant for the future. And that's a little bit of the secret sauce that we have at Rally is making sure that we're finding things that are truly significant now and will be in the future. So there might be times where there's what we think is a great asset and it meets all the marks, it checks all the boxes, but maybe it's already had its moment. And maybe it's something that Google Trends speak to the fact and the social listening speaks to the fact that maybe it's best days are behind it. We try and avoid ever making that an asset that finds its way to Rally. So when we find something that checks all the boxes, has that cultural social relevance, and is something that our investors care about, and we know they truly will care about, we'll buy opportunistically when we can, and we always sort of have a number in mind that our formula kind of spits out and tells us what we should or shouldn't be spending on an individual asset. We also will work with sort of you know best suppliers in the event that it's a consignment or it's a shared equity deal where sometimes someone might have a collector or an estate might have a great asset. They don't necessarily want to go to the auction houses and know how that process works. They'll come to us and we'll make sure that people that really do care about that asset are the ones that are making the investment, which I think is very attractive to a lot of people. Or we'll do something where if there's an institution or a museum, for example, that might have a great asset that's not necessarily on display and maybe it's in the archives, but they want people to enjoy it and be a part of it, that's something that we'll put on the platform as well. So when we think about all those check marks, the social and cultural relevance and the things our investors care about, I think we've gotten it right at a clip that I think many museums or auction houses can't because we're so sort of in tune with what's happening in the space, but also with our users' wants and needs. So that's kind of how that process works. And then once we have the asset, whether it's in a deal on consignment or it's owned or it's something that's in our archives now, each asset becomes its own investment. So we take that asset, we put together all the risk factors, the pricing dynamics, submit it to the SEC as an offering circular. Once approved, it goes live in the app as its own investment. It's got its own total value, its own share price, and then its own group of investors during that initial offering period, which we open up kind of similar to an IPO. We open those up almost every day at this point. Once that offering is fully subscribed, those happen pretty quickly now. We'll maintain the asset, we'll store it, we insure it on behalf of those investors. Then 90 days later, we'll open up uh, bid-ask trading in the app all through registered broker-dealers. So. At any given time, there'll be assets trading, initial offerings happening. There'll be sort of coming soons where you can go in and learn about it before making that investment. And all the activity around those assets that we're previewing at any time before they go live create a lot of responses and conversation with our users all over Twitter and Instagram. We try and make sure that we're always listening to make sure that we can find the next thing that they really want as well. I want to ask one quick follow-up question, which is, I imagine there are potentially some users that are just interacting on the secondary market where they're just looking at what's available and buying. I mean, I don't even know if is day trading a thing there. <laughs> is there some holding period? But talk a little bit about the different dynamics and people that would invest just in those secondaries versus the primary. Yeah. I mean, we're always looking for sort of best in class assets and we're always trying to find assets that are interesting and that are going to sort of evoke emotion, but also make sure that people have the opportunity to invest in that initial offering or wait until something trades and kind of see what the volume looks like and see what the, what the price action looks like. So while we buy for the long term and we always invest our time and our effort into sourcing assets that we feel like have that long term potential, we don't necessarily dictate how an investor is going to move inside of our app. We want to create the opportunity for them to sort of do what they feel is most appropriate for their risk tolerance, for their wallet, and for their future. So a lot of what we'll see is that somebody might make an investment in an initial offering. And if it's their first investment during the first trading period, they might put a couple of shares up at the ass just to see what happens. And end of day, the way it works is kind of one clearing price where you try and bring the most buyers and sellers together at one price so that everybody can kind of get involved. But they might pull that ask at the end. They might sell one or two shares, but keep a piece of it. 
they like to see how it works a little bit before sort of making that second investment sometimes. And we want to afford the opportunity to do that. But I think what we've seen is that the assets that people really care about, they get a lot of volume. There's a lot of price action. There's a lot of momentum behind it. And it's not necessarily specific to any one asset or one asset class or one time period. So you'll have somebody that comes in and maybe they made their first investment in a watch, but then they'll, you know, our Honus Wagner card during the secondary market, which has always been very active during the secondary market. And we published the whole bid ass table so you can kind of see what the volume is. But that's when it gets really interesting for our user base where you'll have a watch that's only five or six years old, but has a lot of attention around it, like a newer Rolex. And that's your first investment. Your second investment is a 100 year old baseball card that you bought during that secondary market. Those all live as part of your portfolio. And that's the experience we've always tried to create so that everybody can diversify, but can make that decision whether or not they want to get involved in the primaries or the secondary market. One other question, just because I hadn't thought of this before, but it just popped into my mind. You know, so you're selling historic assets and uh, just maybe a hypothetical, it might be better framed as a hypothetical. So let's say, you know, I know you mentioned a few times kind of assets related to Michael Jordan. So let's say those are on the marketplace, you've got those trading. Do you notice that whenever there's news about Michael Jordan or say he was to pass away one day, do you see big spikes in prices based off recent events or based off kind of stuff surging in popularity? We have a very responsible user base. So what we've seen is that that definitely brings in a lot of attention. And our Pokemon set is a good example. So we have the first edition, 1999, first edition base set with all the holograms, PSA 10, the best possible example. There's probably, you know, under 15 of those full sets in PSA 10 that are known to exist, of which we have two of them. So when we did the first IPO of that set, it was a $125,000 IPO. By chance, the week before we ran that initial offering, a record was set for the highest price ever paid for a Pokemon set. And it was slightly higher than ours. And our initial offering price was set at that point, so the range was set. We saw a ton of activity and a ton of people coming to that initial offering. So now it's in lockup period for 90 days after that initial offering is done. You have five or 600 investors in that asset. Right before the first trading period, there was another record that was set and everything went to auction and we received a buyout offer for the entire asset as well. It was rejected by the shareholders and now the asset again trades on volume that we hadn't seen to that point and doubles in price in that first day. So again, it goes into lockup. The next time it opens, similar situation, a buyout offer comes in, another huge auction result and now Logan Paul's on YouTube talking about it. So now it becomes even that much more relevant. So I think a lot of what we've seen, price action is always sort of, we want to let the market truly set the price. That's not something that we dictate once it's in the secondary market. But what we want to be able to do is sort of create moments where things stay relevant and where again, it's not just relevant during the initial offering process, but something where we can kind of see based on trends, based on what's happening in the marketplace, that there's going to be more activity and attention around it. For us, price transparency is always a big part of that. And really an efficient marketplace with true price dynamics is something that we feel like should be set by the people who care about it and know it best. I think we're able to do that and we don't necessarily leverage what's happening outside of Rally, but I think what's happening outside of Rally brings in a lot of new eyeballs and people who really understand this space. And that's been a really effective way to price those assets for us. Yeah, super interesting. And obviously, if you're holding that, I mean, I'm sure everyone's excited about <laughs> whenever there's a new story like that or a new high set and that obviously validates your investment and your purchase. Yeah, it's important. I mean, that's all about, again, like everybody wants to say they were right. I get it. Everybody wants to say like they saw that band before it was big. Why not give them the opportunity to do that with everything? And that's always been part of our goal is to democratize that asset. I want to ask about one part of your business, I guess the two parts of your business that I think is fascinating. We talked a little bit about before this interview, and one of those are you've got a retail store, which I think is fascinating, you know, and I'd love to talk a little bit about that. And the second is you also have a warehouse, you know, maybe it's better called archives, where you're storing all of this stuff, which is a fascinating part of your business model, which is very different than NFTs or NBA Top Shot or any of those. Talk a little bit about those two aspects of the business and I guess any insights or anything that's interesting about them. Yeah, I mean, part of that, I'll be honest, when we were a little bit of a smaller company, one of my ideas was like, we should do something around these assets. They have these great stories. I want to be able to tell them as best we possibly can. So we took a little bit of a risk in opening a storefront in Soho here in New York. We got access to a space that was right below our office. So the same landlord and a retail space that's on a block that's one block south of Supreme and one block north of every like cool restaurant in Soho in the middle of Lafayette Street between Prince and Spring. It was kind of like the last frontier of Soho. There's a firehouse, there's a couple of restaurants, there's a parking lot, but it was the one area that wasn't heavily sort of commercialized with retail. So for us, we were like, this is a great spot. It's comfortable. We don't necessarily have to fend off a million tourists a day and have to staff it with a thousand people. We could do something where we can ease into it and see if this works, if people are interested in it. So we opened that first space. We called it a museum. So 
every quarter and it's been closed with, for appointment only for the last few months we're getting ready to do like a new relaunch and a bunch of other sort of big stuff around it but you know most of 2019 all of 2020 for the most part up until the shutdown in march april it was a space that anybody off the street can come in and you walk inside and you'll see when you walk in now it's a 1980s aston martin sitting in the middle on a gold platform and then you have museum cases all around it, a Mickey Mantle rookie card, the first edition of Harry Potter, some really incredible assets that tell the story and allow you to sort of reserve shares and make that investment on the spot through iPads that are set up around it as well. But we also have some people that know these assets that are from Rally that are down there that just allow you to come in at your own speed, walk around, ask questions. We wanted to sort of get people to say, what is this? Because you're in this space where it's this mix of tourists, of people that live in the neighborhood, of you know people that, that grew up in Soho, that are this older generation that are just around the neighborhood, of people who are just you know coming from other boroughs and doing some shopping. So what you get is this huge group, a very diverse group of people who don't necessarily know what rally is, but know what these things are. So when they walk by and they see that there's this half a million dollar car sitting in the middle of a store, they inevitably walk in and just ask questions. And that to us has been a really important driver of the way that we build product, the way we think about our user base, the questions that we want to ask ourselves when we think about releasing new features and new product or new assets. And it's also driven a lot of the conversation around our platform, which is always good too, to have all these things in one place where they come to life, where you know they're real, you can have the conversation with somebody who really knows it. And if you're interested, you can leave, you know, leave with the app and have a conversation with anybody in the store about how the whole process works and then potentially make your first investment. So that's been a really important part of the way that we built this business and the way we built the tangible aspect of this business. Then the other side of that is that a lot of times we'll put the newest assets or the IPOs that are upcoming inside that museum space. But the next step for us is always about sort of, you know, where do we store these, where do we maintain them? So we have a purpose-built facility that we work with on the East Coast where all this stuff sort of lives and it's concierge and it's got obviously full security. It's basically like a vault. Doing something with a space, a bigger space than we have right now is what the goal has always been. And now when you go to our storage facility and you see how much incredible stuff we have down there now, it's a disservice to not have that on display, some of that stuff on display somewhere. So we're thinking about what the future is and as everything starts to reopen, a more sort of investor-friendly spot where everyone can come and kind of be around it and have conversations with people who really understand these assets the same way you do and doing that with partners, doing it ourselves with new storefronts and new spaces, doing it with pop-ups is a big part of what the 2021 and 2022 roadmap look like. Yeah, it's kind of fantasy land, but you know, I almost imagine like an ideal scenario would be, you know, I bought this thing on the platform. Now I want to go look at it or go bring my friends and talk about it. You know, I go into the store, type in some code or go to some special area and I can kind of see that thing. But I just, one other random thing is as soon as you mention that warehouse, the image that comes to mind is, you know, the end of Indiana Jones where that guy's pushing a cart and it's just an endless warehouse with filled with boxes and all sorts of crazy stuff. I wish I could say it's like that. It's a really unique space, but it's also something that we've sort of put together so that we can do photo shoots and a bunch of other things that can best tell the story, but give us enough space and enough room to sort of to let these assets kind of stretch their elbows out a little bit and kind of move around. But the next step for us is always we've always thought about it as as exactly what you describe, where I would love to have a space where you walk in and you take out the right book and it turns the whole sort of shelf around. You walk into this hidden chamber. There we the go. idea of a clubhouse with these assets or with some of the things that are not yet on the platform and be able to create experience around those has always been part of what we wanted to do. For us, 2020 was really going to be about building community and doing more of that. Obviously, the world decided that that wasn't going to happen this past year. But I think as things start to reopen and we see so much more excitement around what we're doing as a business and around the assets, the opportunity to do more things like that is going to happen very quickly for us. And we'll definitely be focusing on that going forward. Yeah. You can almost imagine some sort of cool addition or tangential part of the business model where it's like, as long as you've bought a certain number of assets or, you know, a certain dollar value on the platform, you get access to something like the rally house. And that's where you go and you can see all these things contained in different rooms and it's part social club. And Yeah. You're, uh, you're in our roadmap right now. I think, yeah, I think I might've accidentally sent you over the deck. <laughs> so I want to ask two closing questions about rally. And the first is I want to ask one about building a marketplace because that's what you've been doing and any insights learned there. But the first question I want to ask is another way to think about what you've been building is that you're building a modern Christie's or Sotheby's. Thoughts on that? Clearly, you've really emphasized trust. You've really tried to get these assets that people cannot get any other place. Yeah, you've got a ton of trust and credibility that you're actually buying this thing. I guess other thoughts about what it's been like building a new version of Christie's or Sotheby's or thoughts around that space. Yeah, I'll start with the latter and saying that I'll give Christie's and I think Golden Auctions and some of the big names in the space right now, 
I have to give them all credit because I think there was a time where it could have just gone by the wayside. And people could have said this is the staunchy older thing and it's for the super wealthy. I think that a lot of them have made a strong effort, especially over the last 12 months, to create a place where somebody who might only have like a couple thousand bucks to invest in something to make that first sort of collectible purchase has the opportunity to do that. And I think that's good for the space as a whole. So I got to give them credit for that too. And you start to see that Golden Auctions having a top shot as part of an auction or Christie's doing, you know, CryptoPunks and doing NFTs as a front page bucket. Kind of crazy to see. It's insane. It's nuts. And that would have never happened 10 years ago. Like they would have never made that jump so quickly 10 years ago. But it's great to see all these auction houses understand that a 25, a 30 year old, a 35 year old understands this space. And maybe they have a little disposable income or maybe they're doing it with a syndicate and a couple of friends together and inviting that and allowing that to happen is a really interesting part of what's happening with the auction houses. So for us, we've always looked at this as it's almost like contemporary or it's almost sort of the, it works kind of hand in hand with all the other platforms that exist. And whether it's an eBay or it's a Christie's or it's a Golden or it's a Rally, to us that makes up this landscape of optionality for an investor, for a user, for somebody who just wants to sort of test the waters a little bit to buy or sell. You have a few different options and each one provides its own kind of advantage to the other. And I think that what we've done and the biggest thing for us has always been democratizing access. And I think we do that better than an eBay because eBay might be a situation where it's easy to sell the under 100 or under $200 item. But once you pass that certain threshold, it gets a little bit tougher for a seller. And then for a big auction house, for a buyer, there might not be the things that you really sort of want to get your hands on because of price. So it might be a situation where the million dollar item that you really want is the one that's going to be the headline for a big auction house, but not one that you can get involved in. So we live in that middle ground that allows everybody who understands the assets might have a PSA 1 version of a card. If you want the PSA 10 version on Rally, you can do that without spending an arm and a leg and have true equity involvement. So that's kind of the lane that we've always thought about and that we want to live in from a marketplace standpoint. I have to stop and just ask a noob question. What is a PSA 10? <laughs> so for anybody that, and I should have described this, I should have explained this better. So the grading system for cards and for ticket stubs and some of the items from the past or from the present, sports collectors in particular want to get their hands on. PSA is one of the grading companies that now it's a big part of Collectors Universe, which everybody might have seen in the news got taken private by a group led by Nat Turner and, and a bunch of collectors. But it's a grading company that puts a one through 10 grade on an individual asset, in this case, a baseball card or a basketball card most times. And that represents the quality score that's looked at, at least in the sports card industry as the standard right now is a PSA grade. So they put it in a, a plastic lucite slab and it has all the specifics around the card. It's cataloged so you can look up that number, kind of see what the sales history looks like and gives you the ability to sort of sell it on the secondary market in most cases because it's guaranteed authentic and it's got its grade that goes along with the asset. But in a situation like Michael Jordan's rookie card, there's only 300 PSA 10s on earth. So the logic behind a lot of the price action that you've seen there, which in the beginning of the pandemic, you're talking about a $35,000 card, $30,000 card. Now, most recent sale, over 500000 It peaked at around $780,000. So you know, there's only 300 of those that exist. So you have that scarcity value. You have somebody who's super important to an entire generation and somebody who's legendary in their sport and who's broken every single record basically. And the fact that it's a PSA 10 version of that card makes it the most valuable. So that's the long and short of what PSA means. But there's a lot of situations we see on Rally where somebody might have, you know, a PSA 3 or a PSA 4 version of that card. And you're talking about like a thousand bucks, let's say, for one of those. But you come to Rally, you can get that best quality example. You can get the box that it came from where there might be three or four of those inside of it. That's kind of what we want to provide. So you can have that tangible piece, the one that you care about, and it's the PSA 2 or 3. But if you want the best quality version, we might have it on Rally and you could get involved at a very affordable, approachable price point. Yeah, it's like the most premium exclusive version of the asset. So what you're going to find yeah. on Rally. That's what we're trying to do. But to your point too, the reason that it's taken so long, I think, for us in the beginning to build this out is that we kind of kicked the door down to democratize all those assets, which to a lot of people, it made very little sense early on that there would be a million dollar car that was available to them, or there would be the best quality example of something available to them, or a declaration of independence available to somebody who, you know, only learned about that in seventh grade history class. But now it's like, why would you have that? How's that even possible? This has to be a scam. It has to be fake. There's no <laughs> way. So for us to get people to wrap their head around that was around building this marketplace, knowing, and this is something for every marketplace. And I think that the Coinbase IPO is a good example. Everyone looks at that as this overnight thing, but you're talking about you know decades of work and a 13-year, 14-year-old company. To get to a point now, they had to go through so many boom and bust cycles in crypto and so much of that skepticism early on to get to where they are. But 
I think they built in a similar way to how we're building now, where we sat down, Max, Chris, and I early on, knowing that this wasn't the overnight thing, that we were building for the long term and not building something short term. I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs have to be very deliberate about early on. And I'm lucky and I'm happy that we did that early on when we knew this wasn't going to be something that was, it wasn't a quick flip. We were never building it like that. Just like we look at our investments now, we don't look at them as quick flips. We want to get people involved and think about it for the long term. And that was the platform that we were building. Yeah, I just have to stop there and kind of emphasize that even more because, you know, I've done a lot of early stage investing and it is extremely rare to find people building companies at the earliest stages that are taking that truly long-term approach. And just as you've described it, and as I've gotten to learn more about Rally, it seems you have truly, from day one, really taken that approach. And I'm guessing maybe part of that is that this is just something you're all incredibly passionate about. Like, clearly, this is something you're very, very passionate about. Was there anything else driving that perspective? Because it is not common, and kudos to you guys for <laughs> doing that from day one. I appreciate that. I mean, honestly, and this is part of the conversation about why we never went the ICO route and never tried to jump into crypto head first. It was that we were trying to build something very intentional, and it wasn't a cash grab. And it was something that we told a lot of people early on when we talked to, we talked to a million investors in the beginning, and all their questions at that point were, a lot of them were about the total addressable market and the idea that like, can it really be big? How could it be that big? And we were trying to explain that you have to trust us as people who live this. And our origin story of this company is not a PR thing. It's something that really happened. Like Chris had the opportunity to either buy this awesome Porsche that he really wanted, this vintage Porsche, and it didn't cost a ton of money, but it was also it could be a down payment on a house. And that's the American dream type thing. So he talked to his parents and they were like, you'd be stupid to buy the car, buy the house. So he bought the house. He's flat on paper on the house, up a little bit now probably, and the Porsche was 10X, and he saw that coming from around the turn, and I was the same way with a bunch of things that I really cared about. Max was the same way about some of the things he cared about. So for us to hear no when we were trying to raise money early on a thousand times and be deliberate, intentional about what we were building, knowing that we see around that corner, we know how important these things are to us, we know how important they're going to be to the next generations, there's just no way to trade in and out of it right now. If we keep building that the marketplace will follow us. And as crypto gets adopted more and as equities and options trading becomes more of a thing for a younger generation and they really get it, they'll gravitate towards this. Don't worry about the total addressable market right now because it hasn't even been created yet. We're going to create that. So that was the big driving force is being intentional about building for the long term. To speak from an equity perspective, knowing that it wasn't going to be something that was like exitable in a year. It wasn't going to be it wasn't going to be what Clubhouse is now. It wasn't going to be something that just hit immediately. We're going to have to build to a point that we created not just the trust in the asset classes, but then the trust and rally as a business. So being intentional early on, there's nothing wrong with cash grabs. If that's a business you want to build, there's a million ways to do that. You could you know, buy an existing Amazon store or flip a domain name or something like that. I don't know, but that's not what we were building. We were trying to build something for the long term. One question I just want to come back to is around marketplaces. And I think the question I want to ask there is, so you guys have now been doing this for five plus years of building out a marketplace. And, you know, when you go and listen to interviews with people that are experts on marketplaces or, you know, the CEOs of companies that are building out marketplaces, two things become really apparent. One, they're super valuable once you build them out because they're defensible from a bunch of different sides. But two, what that inherently means is anything that's valuable is also really difficult to build. <laughs> and so one thing I wanted to ask is, any insights or ahas as you guys have been building the marketplace that is Rally and or, and you can answer either of these or both of them, advice for people that are going out to build a marketplace? And maybe that could be cautionary tales. Maybe that's just like, hey, know what you're getting into. But any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, our marketplace is not that different than others in one respect and that everybody and, you know, everybody's bound to do it. It's human nature. We do it. Others do it. You over-index the highs and the lows, I think, when it comes to sort of not just traction, but transactions. And when you see there's going to be awesome weeks, and there's going to be like weeks that are not that great. For us, we always want to sort of make that series of higher lows as we sort of go up and to the right. And if we're in a situation that we feel like something's wrong, we have to change it. We want to be able to move quickly. But you want to have an entire team, and you want to have the mentality that you don't over-index or under-index what you're seeing. You don't want to be in a situation that a bad week that's a bad week triggered by macro things that are out of your control is something that makes you blow up a roadmap or blow up a conversation and start thinking everything from the ground up. So that's really always been the toughest part. And that's something that, again, it's human nature and I've had to get over it. And I think a lot of people early on in our company had to get over it. A bad week doesn't mean the product's done. It doesn't, it doesn't mean the marketplace is dead. It doesn't mean everybody left your busy restaurant and is never coming back. It means that there's some probably things you have to change and things you have to fix. But being able to sort of keep an even keel and know you're building for the long term as opposed to seeing 
the shiny object that everybody loves right now, which might be specific types of NFTs or it might be one specific asset class and jumping to that to change your entire business is something that kills marketplaces. And that's something we've been very deliberate about staying away from. And that's great advice for any entrepreneur. That's something I learned, you know, at Square in the early days is there is, from the outside looking in, a lot of times people just think it's that historic or iconic, literally it's flat and it just goes directly up and to the right. And that is not at all what it's like. There are huge highs, huge lows, and building a company is really this series of challenging endeavors that hopefully each you're getting to another peak on the mountain. But there's a lot of room to be traveled and lows that you've got to go through between those. It's tough because it's like, you know, people make decisions for the present. That's just human nature. It's the reason you'll put your future self in debt to get like a watch right now, but to pay, you know, $100 a month forever. It's a weird thing where you're thinking about right now. And that makes it really, really hard to make good decisions sometimes. So to do it deliberately, to know that, you know, especially if you're doing something brand new and kicking a door down and starting a brand new industry or going with a new asset class or a brand new marketplace, that early traction is something to hang on to and something to really hold on to when you see people that really care about your asset or care about what you're building. And that's what to lean on during the bad times is like, we do that now. When the first person that spent $1,000 in our app is a situation I remember like it was yesterday because it was still so shocking in 2016 that somebody would, that's what I lean on now. I'm like, listen, we were able to get to go from zero to one. That's almost more important than going from one to 100 because along the way, you'll see so many highs and lows. So to lean on the things you know you're doing right is the most important thing that we've been able to do at Rally. Okay, I want to ask a couple closing questions as we kind of wrap things up. And this one's totally just for you. But knowing that you've not only built Rally, you've seen a ton of these just super fascinating, interesting, iconic things transact on the platform. But you're also a collector yourself. What are a few of the things that are just super near and dear to your heart that you've collected? So I try and like divest from anything that's that's on Rally directly. So I don't have any of the stuff that's on the platform. But the stuff that I've always cared about were the things from like the mid 90s, I think, which is like the coming of age moment for me. So that was a few specific things. One, I was obviously into music and music was like a big part of my life, but Nirvana was like this huge thing for me. So I have I have like a ton of Nirvana stuff. And that was something that I was too young. I was like, you know, 10, 11 years old when Nirvana was really the biggest thing on earth. But in my mind, I was like, my first concert is going to be a Nirvana concert. So I have a bunch of tickets from uh, the last run of Nirvana shows. I have a the last ticket for the last US-based show that was never used. It was a radio station giveaway. So I have like a pack that it came in where the person who won never came to pick it up. And it's in like this K-Rock envelope and it's a whole thing. Like that's a really interesting thing that I've always held on to that I've never gotten graded or like gotten authenticated. I just hold on to it. It's in a frame somewhere. That was one. I have a bunch of those Nirvana tickets. It's like a really important thing for me. And then I was really, again, something that makes me feel really good, like a good moment from when I was younger, is Maurice Sendak, who is the author of Where the Wild Things Are. I have a bunch of his original sketches. It was like the first thing. When I first made a little bit of money, like when I first started working and had a little bit of money tucked away, I went to a gallery here in New York, which no longer exists, called AFA. And they had just started putting up a bunch of his stuff. And it was original sketches and some of the original pages from the book. So I have one of the intro pages from Where the Wild Things Are, the original sketch signed by him that I have tucked away somewhere too. So those are things that just like make me really happy as a designer, as someone who thought I was going to be an artist. That's like something to hold on to. And then the whole 90s like grunge run was something that was near and dear to my heart that I want to get as much of that Nirvana stuff as possible. Those are two that are really interesting. That Maury Sendak, I would not have guessed that, but also that to me seems like it's right in the bullseye of what you're trying to do on Rally, which is super scarce. You know, um, everyone knows that name. You know, I'm sure almost everyone listening immediately clicks and, you know, super iconic book. What a cool thing to find. (laughs) I mean, it's, you know, it is, it's one of those things where it's like everybody, I don't know how much those things are worth right now because I've never looked at price. So there are things that I have where I look at them and I'm like... Uh, you know, I should probably part with this. It's gotten to a point where it's made a lot of money on paper. It's something I have tucked away somewhere. I don't really look at it. Those are things that I keep kind of separate. I think that Darren Ravel, who's somebody who's a friend and a really important part of sort of what we built in terms of like keeping me grounded and telling, hey, have you seen this? Look at this. A prolific collector in his own right too. He says something all the time that's true. If you're not willing to sell something that you have, like a collectible or some sort of asset or an item at the price it's at right now, that means you're willing to buy it at the price that it exists at right now. So when you've made 10, 20, $30,000 on paper on something, that sounds crazy to some people. If you don't sell it, the price is irrelevant because that means that no matter how much it costs, you want to hold on to it. And I have so much stuff like that that I keep kind of separate from everything else, you know? That's such a good inversion of that idea. I think that's a really interesting like investing principle as well too. For sure. So the closing question we ask every guest, and you've already shared a ton of interesting stories, is to share either a person or an experience that's had a profound impact on them. I'm sure you've had a ton and you've already shared a few with us. But you know, when I ask that question, does anyone come to mind and can you share just someone or something that's had a profound impact on you? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously the people that are close to me. So, like, the one thing I think about all the time is something my dad told me a while ago. I have, as a designer and a creative, I think a lot of my moods are dictated by how creative and how good I think I am at what I'm doing in the moment. So you have these wild swings. And thank God my girlfriend is able to deal with that and calm me down in most situations. But he told me something a long time. This is like 15 years ago. We were working together on something. And he was like... I think I might have gone, I flew off with the handle on something. And he was like, you know, no matter whether you're right or wrong, if you're an asshole, you're wrong. Like that was always the thing, like no matter <laughs> what it is. And that was something that I try and remember when I'm about to get mad about something. Sure. Because no matter how right you are, if you present it the wrong way, it really is, everything is sales. So whether you're, you know, whether you're trying to sell something to a stranger or you're just trying to sell an idea to somebody who you trust and who you know best, if you turn it into an argument and you turn into that person, you're wrong. It's already too late. You've already lost the argument and it's over. So that's why I try and keep. The other was my AP art professor in high school. And AP art was a joke back then. There was three of us in that class and they made the curriculum for us. And he passed away maybe like six, seven years ago. But his name was Mr. Waite. And we're sitting in the classroom one day and it was everyone was gone. And it's me and him. And I'm just like sketching something. And I was going to run, like two of my friends came in, like, yo, let's go, I forget where they were going to, like, going to Burger King or something like that. They were like, let's get out of here. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I knew he was like, I'm not supposed to leave. I got to finish this and I should stay here doing what I wanted to do and not run with them. And so I was like, nah, I'm going to hang out here. So they left and he was like, you know, you don't always have to do what everybody else is doing. He's like, just do what you want to do. Don't worry about it. And that was something that it's so obvious now, but back then when you're like 16, 17 years old, no, oh, it's impossible. It's impossible. Still, yeah. yeah, it's like everyone you know is about to go do the most fun possible thing. But that's, you don't leave one party to go to a better party. You know what I mean? I'm at a good party already. I'm, I should stay here and do what I love doing, what I enjoy doing. And that was something that stuck with me for a long time too. It still has. Yeah, it's like you live in a constant state of FOMO. When you- it's bad. <laughs> I mean, but it's hard now. Like we're so inundated by information and by like these things that are triggering every receptor. That's something that, that exact quote is a friend of mine named Marco who was just like, Dude, you don't leave a good party to go to a better party. Like, why are you here? Like, what, where are you going to go? Like, what are you going to do right now? There's nothing you want to be doing right now. Going to sh- trying to finish one thing to go rush and do the other is something that's perpetually I've been working on forever. But it's something I try and think about a lot from that moment when I was 17. Those are great. Thank you so much for sharing those. So just to close out, you know, for anyone that's interested that wants to learn more about Rally or that wants to follow you, where can they do that? Where can they find you? Where can they find Rally? Yeah, so rallyrd.com, rallyroad.com will take you to everything you need to know about Rally. We're Rally, R-A-L-L-Y on Instagram. We're at on Rally R D on Twitter. And then I'm Rob Petrozo on every platform. But my DMs are always open. My emails are open. Any ideas, concepts, things you want to sell us or things you want to hear about or things you want to learn more about. Like uh, we're always all available and we want to hear more about what everybody's sort of working on, especially in this space. If anyone finds a triceratops skull, maybe a, you know, a meteoroid <laughs> asteroid. If you're in your backyard digging and you, you find a T-Rex, let me know. I'll be, the, I will show up there quickly. <laughs> Anywhere in the tri-state area, I'll be there within an hour and a half. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I think what you're building is incredible. The story of it's incredible. The fact you're five years in and you've truly built for the long term from day one is incredible. So thank you so much for coming on, Rob. It's been great. Sincerely appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to Outliers. To explore other episodes and sign up for our free weekly newsletter, visit outliers.fm. 